Uh, without further ado, then, we will ask Ryan to pop up. Um, Ryan is going to be talking to us today about the role of the regulators. Thanks, John. I think, Morning. Uh, hang on, I've got my volume. Have you got a camera? Yes. There we go. Got, got, you. got me. Um, <clears throat> perfect. Thank you very much. Um, am I all right to dive straight into it? Yep, I'll leave you to it. Brilliant, thank you. Right, I will share my uh, slides with you all. Uh, yeah, so I think I think first of all, just to introduce myself before I start, um, you might have seen myself and my my team wondering about at some of the events in the past uh, and wondered who we were because we're we're certainly not not buying products or anything like that. Um, but we are part of uh, HD's chemical regulation division. Um, so I am one of the biocide specialists, and particularly I, my, my role really is to specialise in, in efficacy of biocides. Um, so to make sure products actually work, make sure they actually do what they're supposed to do. Um, so what we've noticed really, I suppose, in the past is we've, we've been to a few of these events and, and people are always quite interested to know about the regulations and what's going on with them. Um, and obviously some of that often involves the, the bigger picture of what's happening, uh, you know, after Brexit or after um, political changes and all of that kind of thing. Um, but also lots of questions about kind of how the decisions are made day to day. Um, and what sort of things are involved. And I think I think one of the things we've noticed is, is that, you know, I don't think anyone's ever done just a presentation on how the actual uh, regulation works and how those um, assessments actually take place in the first place. Um, and actually a lot of people didn't seem to be aware that there was an efficacy element to that assessment as well. Um, so I thought we'd give a bit of a, an intro to that really and, and just outline some of the key things that are considered and how that process actually works uh, when products are getting onto the market and coming through us as the regulator um to get out there onto the market so just a brief introduction like i said we're part of the chemical regulation division um which is a part of the health and safety executive um so we are we're not inspectors or anything like that and we're, we're also you know not, not lawyers or anything uh, we're very much scientists as part of that and we work across a few different types of chemicals uh, across the, the chemical regulation division so my team mainly work on biocides um but there are people in, in CRD that work on plant protection. Uh, there are people that work on industrial chemicals. So if, some of you may have heard of things like REACH, CLP, things like that, that are all to do with more uh, large bulk chemicals being, being transferred. And we also have people working on detergents. But obviously it's biocides that's relevant for today. Um, to most of you as pest controllers, that'll be biocides that you're used to working with um, and that you'll be a bit more aware of the legislation. Um, you've probably all heard the term BPR, so biocidal product regulation, and that's the main one that we work with now, uh, making sure that products comply with the BPR. Um, previously it was known as BPD, but not anymore. Um, and also, a few of you may be aware that some products are still under COPR, so the old national regulation before the BPR came into play. Um, so some of them, if they're active substances, aren't all the way through the process yet. Some of them are still under COPR, which is an older, an older regulation. Um, and across BPR, we, we actually deal with 22 completely different product types. So there are some that you'll all be very familiar with and some perhaps not. Um, so obviously here, the pest control one, main group three, is the one that you'll all, all know the most. Um, but we also deal with disinfectants, we deal with preservatives, and we have a couple of others as well, which cover some random odd things like embalming fluids um, and, and uh, paints for the bottom of ships to stop barnacles growing, things like that. But again, obviously, the one that you're probably mostly interested in uh, for today is, is pest control. Uh, which is the third main group and that includes rodenticides in pc14 it includes insecticides the caricides uh, which are uh, things to kill mites and it also includes other products to control the arthropods and then it also includes that extra category there pc19 uh, repellents and attractants there's a few others in there as well uh, that have been thrown into pest control so things like piscicides and avicides so uh, fish and birds um, but we don't tend to see very many of them. In fact, I don't think we've seen any any oversides at all. Um, but they are they are technically included under under the BPR product types. Um, so just to give you an idea, really, next of, of what we do in the process and what our role is here and, and how that works. Um, so products come to us. Uh, so manufacturers will submit 
uh, active substance and product dossiers to us. Um, and as part of that, we then assess various different aspects of that. But the overall goal really is to make sure that the product is safe and to make sure that it's effective. Um, and we have to ensure that in order, you know, in order to make sure that that, that complies with the legislation and with the regulations, uh, whether that's BPR or COPR. Um, what I would again just sort of reiterate is that we are scientists, so we're not we're not lawyers, we're not we're not politicians. Um, so it's not for us to create those laws. It's not for us to to sort of produce the BPR or to alter the BPR. That all takes place at much higher leveling in courtrooms and in uh, in Parliament. Um, what we do is very much the day to day scientific decision making on the data that's provided based on that. So um, so we can only really work with that. Um, we use the GBBPR as a sort of framework, and also we've got lots of guidance documents out there. Um, many of which were, were developed while we were still in the EU, but obviously there are some now starting to, to appear that might show a bit of deviation occasionally, um, but predominantly still the same as the ones that we had before. Um, and we also use those to help us make those decisions. And actually most of what we do is looking at data that, science, uh, that, that applicants have provided to us. So it's scientific data, scientific information uh, that applicants of uh, for, that are you know applying for those different product authorizations have provided to us. Um, so that includes the actual scientific studies that they might send, but it also includes lots of technical information about the way the product works, um, the formulation, you know what ingredients are in there, um, the active substance, all of that kind of information is is provided to us by the applicant, and we review all of that uh, and and reach conclusions based on all of that scientific information. Um, we also consider things like the users and the claims and the way the product's used, uh, the targets that it might be used against, the, the instructions that are going on on the label, uh, and we consider all of that as part of that. So we, we don't just think about the, the scientific data or the law, we also include the kind of hopefully realistic elements of the label that help us to understand how the product is actually being applied and what it's for uh, and what the goal of the product actually is um, and how that might, might affect users. Um, we need to make sure, obviously, after all this is over, when we get to the end of the process, that the label uh, reflects all of those things that we've decided. So if, if there are restrictions or if there are additional instructions or if we've, we've agreed or disagreed with certain label claims, we need to make sure that all of that is included. Uh, all of that information goes into something that we call an SPC, which is a, a summary of product characteristics. But ideally, a, an applicant will then translate that into the label in some appropriate way for the user. And overall, we also try and ensure a level playing field. And what we mean by that is um, a product that has been out there on the market for many, many years, is perhaps made by a, a big manufacturer, a well-known company, shouldn't in any way be, be better off than a, a small company who, uh, you know, they, they should all be providing the same amount of data, the same, the same sort of studies. If they're making the same claims and using, used for the same things, they should be able to provide the same, uh, the same level of, of scrutiny on, on the product. So... That's essentially what we do. Applicants have some responsibilities as well. So on the opposite side, the, the manufacturers who provide all of this to us and, and actually apply for this uh, have some responsibilities as well here. So it's their responsibility to make sure that they are complying with all the right legislation. Um, it doesn't so much affect pest control, but sometimes some of our other uh, other product types, things like disinfectants, sometimes stray across into other types of legislation, into things like medicines. Um, so we, we do see overlap as well. It's not always just complying with those. Sometimes they've got to apply, comply with other things too. Um, so it sometimes goes beyond the BPR. Um, they've got to substantiate all the label claims and all the uses. They've got to be able to you know, provide evidence for all of those, that it works and that it's safe in all of those different areas and all of those different label claims and uses. Um, and that actually extends beyond the BPR as well. So even, even before they start to go through the BPR, um, some of those things about making sure that you can substantiate your label claims are still valid, they're still important. Um, and even people like trading standards sometimes consider that and we're often asked to give uh, input for trading standards on whether whether someone's making false claims and things like that. Um, so after that, once they actually do apply, uh, they are expected to provide all of this information. So provide all of the relevant studies, all of the right information, all of the details about the product uh, and provide all of that to us. Um, and then they need to reflect any outcomes of that on the label um, in the end. 
Um, what I would say is we can only really assess what's provided to us. We, you know, it often surprises me really that, that products that you think would have lots and lots of data are already available, uh, you know, aren't often supported uh, by suitable data because the applicant has just chosen not to generate that data or has, has decided to move to another product or, um, or hasn't been able to generate the data in some way or perhaps it's not even passed a lot of those studies perhaps it's even failed in some cases so um, it often turns up quite a lot where, where you know the data that we get is not not what we should be getting or not what we'd expect um, so if data is poor or it shows that it doesn't work or it doesn't match what's in the risk assessment again that has happened we have had situations where um, you know the, the the applicant have provided data for us in efficacy and data for the environmental or human health risk assessment and it turns out that they've used different application rates or different concentrations and of course that then doesn't give us a safe effective use we're not able to, to conclude on a, a safe effective use overall if that happens um, but it is the applicant's responsibility to provide all the right information to us and to make sure that they they engage with the process properly and, and try and explain everything in full. Um, one of the examples I often use here is you, you wouldn't go to HMRC uh, with a box of receipts and just say, here, have a go at working that out. Um, you know, you, you would be expected to, to actually understand it and provide some something to, to, to clarify all of that. So it's the same really with the regulation. They're expected to, to understand their own products and to, to come to us with some pretty clear information to address all of the concerns in the in the BPR or the or COPR if, if that's the one that they're dealing with. Um, and then just a quick word on labels at this point. So based on what I've just said, like I said, the way that we assess uh, all of this needs to be reflected on the label. So as part of our assessment, we take into account all of those things that you would expect to see on a label, things like users, instructions, target pests, label claims, all of that information uh, goes into our assessment. And so the conclusions of our assessment have to be reflected um, on the label in the end so that we can make sure that it's used correctly and it's it's you know properly uh, properly applied. Um, so the label needs to in, in, you know, include all of those things. It needs to have clear instructions and clear label claims and clear hazard information. Um, and I would say if it doesn't, then that's something you need to raise with the manufacturer or the supplier, or perhaps even, even raise with us. Um, like I say, the information is all based on scientific assessment. So it's not come from nothing. It has been uh, rigorously understood and checked and things. And um, and that's really why it's so important to always follow the label instructions and follow those label claims. You know, don't use the product for anything that it's not intended for. Make sure that you are following all the instructions on the label. And that's one thing that we've noticed when we've been to some of these events. People are often really concerned about, uh, you know, will, will they get in trouble if something goes wrong with a product and, and et cetera. And actually, if, if you've recorded really well that you've used, a, you know, you've, you've used the product correctly, you've done everything on the label correctly. Um, you've not you misused it from, you know, deviated from anything on the label. That does offer you a little bit of protection as well. So that's, I think, just highlights the importance of, of reading the label properly, um, but also of recording the way that you're using products properly, because that really does help. Um, and then also report any issues, including any resistance issues. One of the caveats that we often put in our assessment is that, you know, you should be, uh, any resistance problems should be reported to the manufacturer. So if you can help along those lines with, with doing a bit of that, that, that's also really helpful. Um, for those of you that don't know already, it, the BPR is actually a two-step process. So the first step is the active substance stage. Um, so that is basically the chemical that's in there that's doing the job. So some of you might think of things like bromodialone, which is one of the anticoagulant active substances, or you might think of, um, you know, maybe something like, I'm trying to think of a random insecticide, but I'm sure you can imagine what I mean. Um, so there are, there are plenty of active substances out there that go into product and the way that they are used in products depends on the formulation of the product but the initial active substance stage is a pretty basic assessment of all the risks associated with that substance and the, whether that substance is able to have some sort of effect on an organism. The next stage is the product stage and obviously I can't give any specific products uh, but that is once a product is fully formulated so if uh, if you start to, to you know see things like foodstuffs added for baits uh, preservatives, you might see solvents, surfactants, all of those things being added to the product to make it work properly and effectively. Uh, that's all considered at the product stage alongside the, the active substance. So we consider the whole thing once it's put together. 
Um, and that's actually where we do most of our efficacy assessment once we have a fully formulated product in its actual use. Um, but also at the same time, some of those risks are assessed again to make sure that they, you know, any correct PPE and things are being used and all of that. So there's different parts to the assessment, uh, and this applies to both the, the active substance stage and the product stage. Um, initially, obviously, there's lots of admin type information, details about the manufacturer, uh, the various different trade names and all of that goes, goes initially into the, into the assessment. But probably more significantly, really, for the rest of the assessment is it's all technical, it's all scientific. So there's different teams working on different elements of it, different, different aspects of it. Um, there's a human health risk assessment, which includes toxicology, which is essentially what sort of impact might it have uh, on your body if you, if you ingest it or get it on your skin or whatever, what sort of effect might it have on you. And exposure, so operational exposure, which is to do with how it actually uh, might, might, how you might be exposed to it and what routes might it enter the body or, or get onto the skin or anything like that. The second part of the assessment is a sort of similar thing, but uh, for the environment. So again, ecotoxicology, what sort of effect might it have on wildlife? And face and behaviour, which look at the sort of roots into the environment, so through soil and air and, and water. Um, and then the last part of the assessment is, is our chemistry colleagues look at it to look at whether there are any um, any issues with storage stability. So is, you know, is the product able to be stored without eating its way out of the container? Um, or are there any kind of basics you know issues with it things like uh, flammability all those kind of chemical hazards that you might you might think of when you think of like a school science lab um and then the last one is efficacy which is my role and my my team's role um and we look at whether the product is actually working so whether or not it actually does what it's supposed to be doing and the combination of all those things is, is essentially what makes up the assessment so I'm going to dive into efficacy because it's the one that I know, and it's probably really the one that's most, most of interest to all of you, thinking about you know how you uh, you know uh, deal with a particular pest situation. It's probably quite useful to know how we actually assess whether that product works. Um, so starting really with with what efficacy means, it's essentially effectiveness, um, and it's, effectiveness is probably a more user friendly way to put that. But it, it basically means its ability to, to have the right effect. And the BPR says that all products that are, are authorized have to be sufficiently effective. That's one of the criteria uh, to be able to be allowed under the BPR. So the first thing that we we have to think about is why do we assess efficacy at all? So the first thing really is, does the product do what it's supposed to do? And I suppose the risk there is if it's not doing what it's supposed to do, there's no point in taking any risk at all. All chemicals have some element of risk. All products have some sort of risk associated with them, whether that's a, a big risk or a small risk, there's always some kind of risk of using chemicals. So we need to make sure that it's doing what it's supposed to do because if it doesn't, then there's no point in using any chemical at all. Um, and it sort of makes the whole thing quite pointless. The second thing really is whether it's it's going to meet your expectations as users. So we have to consider the different types of users and, and whether it really does what they're expecting it to do. Um, one of the issues we've had in the past is something, you know, this, this issue of what we would call scientific significance. And when you're in uh, when you're in academia and things like that, you, you have this idea that, you know, you can check that something is having a, a significant effect. Uh, statistically and that looks all very good and so something like for example a rodenticide it might kill 50 rodents out of 100 and that's very significant that's academically very significant from a scientific point of view but you've still got a, quite a big rat problem um, and so you, you've not necessarily dealt with the issue so we have to think about what is it that the consumer actually needs what is it the consumer actually wants it to do in the end um, is it worth the risk? So balancing out, you know, the risk versus the risk assessment and the, the efficacy assessment and balancing the two, looking at whether or not we have got that safe, effective use. And if we haven't got that safe, effective use, which, again, a lot of you might know from things like the rodenticides where there are quite, you know, quite significant risks, is there sufficient reason that it's actually essential, um, that we actually really need it anywhere because of the way that it works and how useful it is as a product? Um, are there any risks of failing to use a biocidal product? I'm sure uh, many of you will have heard Alex, Alex Wood, who I think is on today later on, but many of you will have heard him talk about some of the risks of uh, rodent infestations, for example, things like Viles disease uh, can be a big problem. 
Um, but also lots of other things as well, you know, repellents preventing spread of malaria when you go abroad, or whether that's things like um, even even structural damage can be prevented by some biocides, um, or, or even environmental issues, you know, control of things like uh, grey squirrels to prevent uh, damage to local ecosystems. So all of these things are also considered as part of that. Um, is it likely to result in resistance? So I think uh, that's probably one that, that people don't realise that we have as part of our assessment, but we do consider resistance and resistance issues. Um, we have some product types where resistance is not yet really a, a significant problem, but we have lots of other product types where they are. And I think, unfortunately, pest control is, is probably the, the biggest area. Things like rodenticides and insecticides have, have probably the most significant resistance issues. Um, and then also what kind of st strategies need to be in place to deal with those when, when they do occur. Um, and then also we look at whether it's humane um, or at least as humane as possible. Again, it's not always the case. And, and sometimes we have to overrule that in favor of uh, products not always being available that are, that are better. Um, but it is a consideration and it's something that we also so include when, when there are problems. We get lots of different types of data to assess efficacy, but the big the big kind of three categories that we see are field data, which are essentially real life treatments, um, just with lots of extra monitoring going on. So they demonstrate efficacy in, in these kind of real situations, often real infestations and, and sometimes even real pest controllers for pest control products um, go out and do these. And, and we just have these kind of extra monitoring steps. Um, but that provides a really good realistic um, realistic view of, of how the product is working in real life. And, and for pest control, we, we often prefer field data as much as possible because it really helps to understand uh, the way the product works in, in real life. Simulated use data, which is kind of somewhere in, in the middle um, of, of field and lab data. So lots of things to be considered about which are the most important factors out there in the field that you need to take into account. Um, so sometimes people do this, sometimes people release uh, target pests into a, a room or into a, a pen or something like that, and they, they monitor the way that that works. But it's very dependent really on, on the situation. And then the other one is lab data. Now lab data are, are less realistic, but they do give us really clear results. So for some uses, they're really helpful. Um, and the, the one that really always springs to mind for pest control is what we call palatability data, which I'll come to in a minute, um, but checking that actually the product is edible and, and is is something that the rodent will favour over something else uh, when it's when it's got other food sources available. It's much harder to monitor that in the field, um, but when you can just provide them with a couple of food sources uh, in a lab trial, it's it's much easier to monitor how much they've actually eaten. Um, so I'm just going to finish off by going through a couple of case studies, really, just to illustrate what I've said what I've said there. So for example, a, a rodenticide, um, imagine we've got a, a claim for control of rats and mice in and around buildings and in open areas, um, and it's suitable for use in sewers. So again, uh, you'd expect to see some pretty clear information on the label about how much to apply, where to apply, all of those things need to be included, as well as those clear label claims for, for what the target, target organisms are as well. So I think, I think we've heard this being discussed in the past at some of the events that we've been to, but you'll, you'll probably all be aware that there are certain species that represent some of these groups. Um, so the easy one, the obvious one, is, is Mus musculus representing house mice. Um, I think that's all pretty well known now. So that's, that's the test species that we expect all of our tests for mice to be done on. Uh, Mus musculus is the one that we would normally expect to see. For rats, it's a bit more complicated because there are two species and the biology is, is quite different. Now, it used to be uh, previously that, that Rattus novedicus, so the, the Norway rat or the brown rat, would cover cover both species of rats, but that's that's gone now. The guidance has changed a little bit and we expect to see both uh, in testing against rats if they just want a general rat claim. But they could still technically, if they wanted to, claim one or the other uh, if they just have data on one. But actually to claim rats generally, you'd expect to see both. And to claim rats and mice, you'd expect to see all three. And obviously the, the use area and the pattern of use might be different for the mouse. Um, now, rodenticides are typically bait products. So we don't just need to see that the, the rodents are killed. We also need to test palatability. We need to make sure that they're willing to eat it. 
Um, we have had situations in the past where the, the product works well once they do eat it, when they're given no other choice, but actually when presented with alternatives, they, they won't really uh, go for the bait. So we have seen that in some, some testing in the past. So it's, it's really important that we make sure that, that happens. Now there's lots of different ways that all of this can be done across the, uh, the different types of, of trials. Uh, I'm not gonna go through them, through them all here, um, but what I will say is the, the two that tend to happen are a, a choice test, which is a lab test, where essentially you can see there from the diagram, which I'll, I'll give credit to my colleague for making. Um, essentially, the rodent just gets a, an option between a bait and a, a non-bait product. So a bait that's that's got the, the active substance in and then some sort of alternative food source, preferably something similar to what a rodent would eat out there in the field um, as an alternative so that they've got the option and we can monitor how much of each they've actually taken, how much of each they've actually consumed um, and then monitor whether that, that is sufficient amount to, to actually kill them. Um, and then we'd expect always in, in rodenticide some sort of field trial really because that's, that's the most realistic way to do it. Occasionally we allow simulated use if it's extremely robust. Uh, but usually we go for field data because it's it's much more accurate. And like I say, that can often be essentially like a real pest control treatment. Um, there are restrictions on animal testing as well for, for rodenticides uh, that are set by the Home Office, but they don't include field trials because they're essentially a real, a real use. So um, they don't often incorporate field trials as part of the restriction. So uh, as much as you have to be very careful about lab testing, that's not always the case for field trials. Um, and then additional testing sometimes might be needed for, for specific things like, for example, sewer use. We'd expect some testing in damp conditions uh, so that we can see that it still uh, remains palatable and effective after it's gotten damp. Um, just another quick, quick case study before I finish. So uh, this one's slightly different. So an insecticide used by professionals in, in various different settings, commercial, domestic and rural areas. Um, and you might find claims things like these general claims, like claims against flying insects, for example, um, often occur on a lot of labels. So again, for that, it's not practical to test absolutely every single flying insect out there. We'd expect them to have some, some, um, some to represent that, but they've also claimed there a couple of specifics. So just to illustrate how we would assess that, for flying insects and crawling insects, there are specific lists of organisms that you have to include for those. Uh, so you can see there for crawling insects, cockroaches, sometimes ants, depending on the way that you've worded the claim. So if it's something that implies that you're going to kill a whole nest, we'd expect ants as well. But for flying insects, uh, flies, mosquitoes and wasps are considered to be the kind of group that cover a bit of everything there um, and cover that claim of flying insects. So if they test against all those three, they can some, often have that, that general claim. So from there, uh, flying insects, like I say, flies, mosquitoes and wasps, um, you'd expect to see at least lab data and field data on, on house flies, so mosca domestica. And probably in this situation, the farm is probably the worst case scenario where you're going to get the most, uh, the most difficult to control fly populations. Um, Similarly, a field trial against wasps, again, probably a nest is, is the most challenging situation there, but there might be differences depending on the way the product's used. Um, and lab data and field data against mosquitoes. Uh, and again, if you've heard of a Q-like species of mosquito, they're the, the big ones that we find in, in Europe um, that are often the most, most difficult to kill because of their size. Uh, when we deal with repellents, we tend to go for other ones because they're more aggressive at, at biting and things like that. But for for um, killing, we're talking about Culex because it's it's quite large, it's quite robust and difficult to kill. Um, and then lastly, of course, we had some of those additional claims. So we had things like, even though we've got broad claims, we had some specifics mentioned. We had stable flies. We know we've covered house flies already because that's part of the flying insect claims. So they could claim that if they wanted to, but they'd have to have some specific data on stable flies if they wanted those as well. Um, and then as well at the bottom, we had a, a, bit of an, a bit of information about lasting for four weeks. So we'd expect the testing to take that into account in some way. So if they were to do, for example, field trials or simulated use trials, we'd expect them to conduct that over a four week period and to have maybe people walking on the surface surface or cleaning the surface or whatever might happen in that time uh, to take all of that into account. Um, and that's all the sort of technical stuff from me. Um, if you do want any more information, there is information on the HSE website. Um, so it includes things like lists of approved active substances, lists of authorised products, um, 
but by all means you can you can go and have a look at those and also if you've got any questions or whatever you, there are some contact details on there um, but yeah does anybody have any questions i'm going to close my uh, presentation so that i can see you again thank you ryan that was fantastic um there is one question just popped in um is the palatability test for rodenticide products assessed with a time of year and environmental conditions in the field uh, sorry i'm just reading the the extra bit there so essentially often the, the choice test the palatability test is often done in the lab so that wouldn't take it into account but we would have some sort of field trial and that might take quite a long time it might take several weeks um we don't necessarily have it at different times of year so that's not something but i think maybe that's something we can we can consider and think about when we're we're assessing that whether that's something we need to start taking into account it's certain, certainly something i'll i'll take away with me as a as an issue because uh, it sounds as though maybe there's a bit of variability in the way that that they might behave in those field trials throughout the year um it is something that we consider for insecticides because insecticides are very seasonal. So uh, we often think about what time of year and, and sometimes you see, uh, you might see that the product looks like it's really working, but actually it turns out that the control data shows that it's just dropped off because of the time of year or whatever. Um, but we haven't necessarily thought of that so much for rodenticides. So that's something I'll uh, I'll take away with me if that's something that's that's worth considering. Thank yeah, it's, it's maybe a um, with natural food available in the summer that might mm. not be available in the winter sort of scenario, um, mm. moving from one type, one preference to a, a different type of preference. Um, so, yeah, do you I've got a couple of questions, but um, yeah, do you uh, fit in with once the product's been tested or do you get involved sort of during the testing and then like a bit of back and forth with, with that? It really depends. There are some some times where. An applicant is going to do quite standard testing so we'll we'll wait and they'll often just send that to us and we'll, we'll get that from the beginning um there are times when we've got really novel and unusual products where they'll ask us to get involved earlier and we'll chat with them and discuss what sort of testing they might do um and we'll we'll bring all of that forward and chat that through with them so it, it depends really on the product for something like a redenticide if it's especially if it's like an easy one like a, a use indoors or whatever um where they're doing a quite basic field trial and quite a basic choice test we probably wouldn't need to do that um but for some of the because there's a bit of guidance out there exactly how that should work and stuff but for some of the others we have to we have to get involved earlier just to help them understand what sort of testing might work yeah um and one question that we get asked quite a lot um sort of day to day is uh products and how they're going to change and are there going to be new products or are we going to adapt what we've got into something different what what do you think the the sort of step forward will be so what do you mean by that in terms of um so like uh with problems with like resistance and things becoming more um sort of apparent and we're doing more testing on it um do you think there'll be like have the bean without letting the cat out the bag i guess more products being um circulating in that sort of testing stage um like newer products or will we see sort of changes to the current products i think i think it might be a combination of both to be honest i think we've you know, the, it's quite limited, really, especially for something like, like redenticides at the moment. It's still very, very limited on on what I would call mode of action. So uh, essentially yeah. anticoagulants is still the big one, isn't it? Um, hopefully we'll start to see more coming through with different types of actives. Um, but also, yeah, I think I think the way that we use products and the way that they're balanced with even with non-chemical products as well. You know, we, we don't cover those. We don't deal with those. But we do sometimes consider in our resistance assessments how it might be included in like a wider uh, approach to include other things. Um, so, yeah, I think I think probably a combination of the two, really. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see how that develops over the, over the next sort of few years and, and what products. Yeah, definitely. Um, what products do change uh, and how um, that was great. Ryan, thank you very much. Um, Brilliant. Thank you for having me. Hope it was spot useful. On. Spot on. Thank you.